Welcome to the Asset Revolution Podcast, where each week, your hosts from Arbor Digital provide educational opportunities for financial advisors and individual investors to gain knowledge in this emerging powerhouse that is digital asset investing. The Asset Revolution Podcast is your connection to the future of digital assets and an opportunity for anyone to get off zero. Let's dive in. All righty. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the latest edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. Uh, today, I'm excited uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being uh, our guest here, uh, Adam Bloomberg, um, who is not going to need a huge introduction. I'm sure you've all heard him on Bloomberg TV or uh, other speaking spots and maybe seen some of his content, which we're going to dive into. But uh, also the topics we're here to kind of discuss, uh, one being the designation for digital assets, the CDAA, um, as well as the organization kind of attached to that, um, Planner DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization, which has got a lot of buzz right now. It's kind of the next trend, if you will, uh, for traditional uh, to start grabbing, gravitating towards uh, that's happening within blockchain and crypto. I'm so excited to do that. But before we do any of that, Adam, man, thank you so much for joining. Oh, Mark, thanks so much. Great to be on here. Yeah. And before we jump in, too, uh, I like to let everyone else introduce themselves because, you know, you know yourself better than anybody here. And I can go through your LinkedIn profile and all your professional, uh, you know, accomplishments. Uh, but give us a give us a sense of who you are as a human first and then tell us a little bit about your your background. Uh, okay, as a human, I'll start with that. Um, I, like you, am in Texas, so we're, we're fellow Texans here. We're not too far from each other. Uh, I'm in Houston. And uh, for years, I was actually a financial advisor. I'm a certified financial planner. I had an RIA here in Texas and got interested in crypto in I don't know, 2017. My, my business partner, Ron, got me into it. And uh, shortly after that, went down the proverbial rabbit hole learning about blockchain and crypto and DeFi before it was DeFi and started thinking about all the different ways that, that the technology at least was going to change our lives and got really excited about it. And that was like 2018, started thinking about things like um, uh, real estate title and of course, oil and gas, since we're here in Texas and supply chain, which of course we're having so many issues with now in the world uh, and all the different ways that blockchain was going to change this. And then DeFi really started up in early 2019. And that kind of got me excited because now it's coming into my world. It's coming into my wheelhouse of not just uh, not just buying tokens and hoping they go up in value. But now we're talking about being able to re reinvent the financial ecosystem. And that, that's what uh, really got me excited. I uh, kind of wish I'd have gotten excited enough to just quit whatever I was doing and go jump into one of those DeFi protocols and say, I'm going to help you build it. And, <laughs> you know, right now you and I might be talking on completely different circumstances where I'm some billionaire owner, you know, owner of a whole bunch of DeFi tokens, but that is not the case. I uh, kept the financial planning practice for a while. Uh, in uh, 2019, we launched a YouTube channel just to explain everything, me on in front of the whiteboard, just talking and explaining it all. Yeah. And then last year, uh, basically shut down the RIA to, to educate people and primarily financial advisors about crypto and, and DeFi. Um, this year, we started up the Certified Digital Asset Advisor designation and course, which you alluded to. And uh, we started that up in February. So Ron and I had the, a company called Interaxis, which we started, at, which was basically just education about crypto. Uh, we met Steve Larson, who had a, uh, his own RIA and a CE company, and we got together and created the Certified Digital Asset Advisor cohort-based course in designation, which we started in February. Uh, so that is a six-week cohort-based course because it, it, with, with live events. So every Friday, we do a live session, uh, which I think you've, you've sat in on one or two of those, yep. where um, we just answer questions because we know that this is a, such a new subject. It's so different than anything you've ever heard of before, everything you've ever learned in finance, that we feel like there has to be some live Q and A where we, we can answer questions about the technical parts. Uh, we do a lot, you know, we talk about whatever news happened. Most importantly, we talk about client conversations. It all comes back to how you're going to talk to your clients. If you're a financial advisor, how are you going to talk to your clients about crypto and about DeFi and about their portfolio now uh, based on whatever's happening? You know, we, of course, this week, we'll probably talk about the wild volatility we've had in the last week. 
uh, and, and why that might be happening. Because, you know, if you're an advisor and you get your clients into it, the clients are going to call yep. and you're going to have to know the answers, just like, you know, the answers on everything else. You, you, you should know some of the answers on this. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we'll not to get too sidetracked before, because there are a couple of things that you mentioned there that I'd love to dive into more, um, kind of how you got in and kind of the excitement. I mean, it's a couple of big, big leaps you took there, but, but yeah, I think, uh, what's really good about the live sessions and the ability to ask questions um, in that type of environment is you start getting into deeper answers to things like market structure or, you know, why things happen the way they do. And speaking to the recent volatility, you know, it's, it's similar to how these markets operate have been operating now for the last, you know, however many years Um, things happen very fast. Um, When, When you operate on something as efficient and as programmable as a blockchain and as fast as a blockchain, you're going to get things happening faster and you're going to get uh, sharp movements much quicker than you would obviously in what we're used to experiencing in traditional markets. So um, I love that that's part of the CDAA designation is that live session for sure. But take me back to a little bit because you just start, you went into how you made this full transition to this education company with Interaxis with your business partner. Um, and then you guys just made the leap, you know, what was it about learning when you were going through that initial learning and the, the proverbial rabbit hole and learning about blockchain and crypto um, and how it can change things? What made you, what risk analysis did you do? And you came out to the other side to say, yep, this is, this needs to happen. What happened? Um, Well, I think some of the early risk analysis I did, I don't know if it was so much risk analysis. I, I, you know, the first thing I did in this, which a lot of people do is I traded, right? Because I was like, oh my gosh, I can trade these things all over the place. There's, it's like the wild west. Uh, I learned that I am horrible at trading. I'm really good at charts. I can draw charts. I can draw support, resistance, trend lines. Uh, I can look at RSI. I can find all those things. The emotions get me, right? When, when it's real money being moved around, uh, it, it gets to me and I can't sleep and I have anxiety and I sell before I should sell and I buy before I should buy and I get emotional and irrational and I'm a horrible trader. But as, as a that, lot of us are. <laughs> as, right. The, the only people who should be actively trading crypto or anything else for that matter is the people who have found that they're really good at it, yep. not the people who just want to make money at it. It's the people who have found that they're really good because it's a completely different mindset. It's not a... Mm-hmm. It's not a bullish or bearish. It's I don't care. I'm trading the chart and the chart's going to tell me which way to go. And even if Bitcoin goes from 50 to 60, if I wasn't in the trade, look, I'll get it from 60 to 65. I'll get it from 60 down to 50. It, it doesn't, matter. doesn't matter. I'm going to trade whatever the chart tells me to, to trade. And I'm going to set my, my uh, stop loss. And I'm going to set my take profit and everything else. And, and I'm going to be completely unemotional. I can go play golf or something and mm-hmm. everything's going to be set to go. And if I miss something, I miss something. It's not a big deal. I don't have that mentality. I have the like, I I, I need to be in on it all the time or I need to be out and it's gut wrenching and I don't like it. Um, That sent me down again, the the rabbit hole of learning how blockchains work and the technology works and thinking about the use cases to the point that I was researching it. I was watching videos. And of course, Mm -hmm. you know, back in 2017, there wasn't anything sophisticated in terms of, of ways to learn. It was a lot of, you know, YouTube videos by people who are really, really into the technology a yep. lot of words I didn't understand, a lot of them in countries I didn't uh, understand very well, a lot of white reading white papers. And so it wasn't that easy, but the, the best, um, I, I guess the risk analysis I gave was my wife was like, I've never seen you this interested in anything before. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is really cool stuff. And if I, you know, if I go back a little bit um, to get, uh, I don't know, theoretical, whatever it is. I was in college around the time that the internet kind of started to get even developed at all. So I was in college between 93 and 97 Mm -hmm. there in Austin, where you are as a UT. And um, it was the early days of, of actually having email and using it. It was the very early days of the internet. I downloaded Netscape. Uh, the, the, the browser right when it came out and I joke all the time, like the only reason I downloaded Netscape was so that I could get fantasy football scores more quickly. (laughs) That was it. That's the only thing I used it for. I, I, there was nothing else on it. There was nothing else to use it for, but I could get fantasy football scores really quickly. 
that was it. And, and honestly, that's how someone sold to me. My, my, one of my buddies said, download this Netscape thing and you'll be able to get the football stats right away. I was like, well, that's really cool. Let's do that because that'll save me a ton of time. Uh, you know, so I don't have to look at the scores the next day in the paper. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons I did it. And, and early on, even I said, you know what? This internet thing is probably going to be big to the point that I got an HTML code book. I tried to learn HTML, which I'm not, a, I'm not a programmer or anything like that. And the book was like this thick. And at some point, like I read this much and I said, you know what? That, that, I'm not going to learn this. I, I'm going to go play basketball. I'm going to go drink beer, like go on dates, whatever. I'm not going to do this. Yeah. And looking back, I'm like, man, I, like, I called it. I wish I would have gotten in and I kind of missed it. Like I, I went into, into tech and finance and stuff, but I didn't, I didn't embrace that. And now I see, I, as soon as I started learning this, I said, this is the next one of those. Mm -hmm. And I understand enough to know what I missed before. And this is bigger because, because not only do I kind of understand the internet because I've been using it my entire adult life, but I kind of understand finance because I've been in the world for 12 years. So while th this totally puts all that together, I'm not going to miss this one because I'm old enough where I'm not going to have that many more shots to be in early on something like this. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate you going into that because uh, for the audience listening, it's important that they see that there's the, we call it the spectrum of adoption, right? Um, and there's different ways and different people go through this um, in their own ways. Um, but you sharing that story and kind of how high impact that this technology can be on so many different, well, pretty much everything, right? Not not it's it's hard not to take that leap once you realize like oh and you're intellectually honest with yourself mm -hmm. about the use cases and what this can go beyond because there are things that we're still figuring out what blockchain can do what it what it can't what it's best used for all that stuff like that's mm -hmm. we're still so early with all of that and so hearing others especially those like them who um, work as advisors or plan or financial planners to have that understanding, I think really helps people. You take more people with you on your journey when they can connect to you. So um, I always right. like to hear that. So I appreciate it. And, and you're right, Mark. We, we, we really don't know where this is going to go. I, I joke all the time. Like when a dude started selling books in Seattle on this web thing and had people put in their credit card number and expect to get a book in like a week and a half, that led us to where we are today. Yep. And no one knew that. No one knew you were going to be able to summon a car with your phone one day. But that's where it got us. I don't know where we're going to go. And, and everyone tries to jump ahead and yep. go, oh, th this Web3 is going to totally replace all social media. And you're going to own everything you, you've ever written in your life. And you're going to get to capitalize on that. And like, I, I don't know. And, and you don't know. And none of us really knows what's going to happen with crypto and DeFi and Web3. What I do know is... Uh, coming especially from the financial world, but just coming from the world, coming from knowing business. And, I, you know, we've had clients, especially that are in, in the construction industry and being in Texas, we've had oil and gas and a lot of medical and stuff. And you go, a lot of this just makes sense in those. It's just a natural evolution. You take the technology that we have and it evolved into the internet and email and servers and cloud computing and everything else we have. And, and it eventually evol evolved into Bitcoin and blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance and decentralized file storage and all that. It's just a kind of a natural evolution. So, and, and humans tend towards whatever that natural evolution is of technology and finance. And I'm kind of going to go with that. I'd rather go with that than dig my heels in and go, no, no, no. We've been doing things the same way in, in finance for 80 years. I'm going to go with that. It, it got us to a pretty good spot because on the other hand, I go, technology progresses. It, it continues to move us forward. And I'm not going to ignore that mm -hmm. because we tend towards what's more efficient. And this is just more efficient and it's better. And right now you might look at it and go, my, you know, the, the UX and the UI is horrible and the, you know, it's slow and, and the gas fees are high, whatever, but it's better technology. It, it's better for things to be stored this way. It is better for us to have 
to have control the way you can see that you can eventually have control via a wallet versus via a username and password. You can see that that's going to be better. And I'd rather go down that road of the better technology and look at the better, if what we think is the better technology and these really ridiculously smart people isn't going to win, I would have rather lost that way following those people than the digging my heels in kind of way. Yeah. What is it? One of the most destructive phrases in human humankind is uh, we do that. We do it this way because that's the way it's always been done. Exactly. Read that somewhere. Um, so yeah. I, yeah. And, and so it's not like destruction just for destruction. And it's not, I don't, I, like, I don't want to overthrow banks because I'm angry with them or something or, or yeah. they're corrupt or whatever. Like I can summon all those things and say the banks caused the 2008 financial crisis and there's too much power and I don't like the fees they charge me for, to write a check and all those other things. But what it comes down to is this is just natural. Like it, the, the technology got us here and we're going to keep going where the technology got us. Just like, uh, I'll tell you, I, I drive an electric car because- it just makes more sense now that we have the, bat, the the capacity to develop batteries. But just like with Jeff Bezos and Amazon, it took a, a crazy dude out in California to go, no, no, I'm going to mass produce this. I'm not going to make this a novelty. I'm going to mass produce it using better battery technology. And I'm going to build a car around essentially a computer. Mm -hmm. And now everyone's doing it. But Look, car companies could have done that for years and they just decided not to because they kind of said, no, no, we, we build gas cars. And all of a sudden, better battery technology comes out and everyone's building an EV. And, and you know, they could have done it. They just yeah. chose not to. Yeah. And then when money and power is consolidated over such a long amount of time, it's, it becomes even harder to move and progress. And so that's where you fall into those traps. And those businesses that are successful are the ones that are going to are able to adapt right the the businesses of the future are going to be the ones that are able to be nimble and flexible and, and move fast because again with all this technology everything's going to move fast but but yeah i, I love that kind of because it, it kind of speaks to i think a lot of people and maybe you see this too i think a lot of people are surprised when you say when i say i made the leap into digital assets or crypto um everyone immediately assumes that you must be that crypto evangelist who's gung-ho at tearing everything down and every and you know we're going to replace it again DeFi example you know every everything's going to get replaced with you know um decentral with DAOs and uh with code and we're never going to trust anybody ever again where no it's it's okay you don't have to be that like sure like there are elements of that where we can speak to and like oh i can see how why some people are like that but no like when you just take when you use when you're intellectually curious about this and you just you get a even just a base layer understanding of the tech, it's like, oh, it's just an upgrade. Like, and that's okay. Like, it's okay to upgrade. In fact, you know, the companies that are starting to adopt blockchain, they're they're the ones that are like, okay, it's okay that we upgrade. And that's where I I, I now want to, I guess, let's before we we lose track a little bit, um, I do want to kind of talk what then needs to happen in order for for those upgrades to happen, right? Um, and I think it all starts with education. So you mentioned CDA and kind of how you got into it with your business partner and how you made the leap in February. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the CDA is, how you guys built it at first, take us through kind of where it's been, uh, that way we can, and then we can go into where we are currently. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, that's really interesting to actually talk about where it's been because, um, I, you know, if anyone's ever watched our YouTube video or our YouTube channel or anything, I have a really hard time doing like an eight minute video. Everyone keeps telling me you got to do like eight to 10 minute videos. And every one of mine is like, is like 18 to 20 minutes. Yeah. And it's because I have to start all the way at the beginning and not all, all the way at the beginning of blockchain, but for everything we explain in DeFi and crypto, you have to almost start with like, okay, in traditional finance, here's where it, how it works. Let me explain that to you first. And then I got to bring you to the blockchain part or the, or the DeFi or the crypto part. Okay. So in starting this course, my, the, the, thinking has to go, what would a financial advisor have to know in order to help a client, in order to make this a part of their practice? And I kept trying, and, and I had so many people say, look, just explain to financial advisors just enough that they can get their clients into Bitcoin. That's it. Just enough, like the there's 21 million of them, store of value, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. But it always, the, the, the questions I always got when I explained that stuff was, why are there only 21 million? How, come, how can you not change it? Why is this better than gold? Why would I invest in this? What backs it? And I always had to backtrack all the way to mm -hmm. why did Bitcoin begin? How does a 
how does a chain of blocks cryptographically linked work? Why does it work? What does a block look like? What do transactions look like? And so we, I said, I have no choice. We have to go back literally to the beginning and explain where we were like prehistory, like the, before the Big Bang, before the, the white paper came out, why the white paper came out, and then what Bitcoin did, how it works. And we have to talk about mining. We have to talk about energy. We have to talk about, uh, about incentive mechanisms because DeFi, crypto, it's all built around incent- incentive yep. mechanisms. That's it. And aligning one the big, right? In, in aligning, aligning the incentives in a way that you and I have the incentive to do something to 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 perform some sort of behavior yep. that the the those that derived it and the market in general wants us to perform, and disincentives if we don't do that. That that's all it is, because in the absence of that, we outsource that to banks and governments and everyone else. And we say, you tell us what is okay to do, and you tell us what you want us to do. And when we give them that power then they take advantage of it and we don't want them to take advantage of it. And they take all the fees and, and everything else. So we had to go back to the beginning. We had to say, here's what Bitcoin is. And, and just in excruciating detail, yeah. how it works. And it, it, it's really hard because you have to get people past a certain point of understanding the technology. Then we have to talk about wallets and how private key and public key works and security and and because that is what, for a financial advisor, is going to lead you to different discussions of custody. Why would I? Why, why is a uh, a Gemini, a custodian like that, different than having a hard wallet? Different than a, a GBTC or an ETF or something? What is the difference? Well, you can't do that without explaining wallets. Mm-hmm. And I could say, well, it's different custodial technology, but that doesn't help. I have to go back to here's what a wallet is. Here's a private key, public key. Here's the difference between having your your Bitcoin on uh, at Coinbase, the exchange versus having it on your hard wallet. And you just always have to go back to the beginning. So that's why it became such a long course because you can't go forward without going all the way back to those beginnings. Because I, I tell people, it is unlike any asset you've ever seen. It's unlike any financial technology you've ever seen. And that is not in any way, shape or form hyperbole. It is different than anything else you've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, going into that is really important. And all all those other pieces is really important because you're going to have your clients who are going to come and you mentioned this before, you know, just to be able to talk to clients about it, but then what the way, what all that does for you, you then now are equipped to ask questions of your clients, right? Like, so if you're an advisor and you don't go through any uh, the CDA or any other, you know, certification, um, or don't educate yourself and a client comes in, you're not going to know what questions to even ask to get even the clients to help them understand what it is that they are doing, because right. they probably, they probably have only seen certain things. And the, and again, when I say that they, they, uh, clients, um, and not all of them. There are probably some that are very in tune with everything and understand how these things work. And especially if you're a developer or engineer or whatever the case is, like right. they probably understand the technology more than you do, but you can at least help them from that behavioral standpoint by asking those questions. Like, so you mentioned going into like, what are wallets? What are the private public keys and those things? When you understand that you can then ask clients questions like, well, how are you protecting yourself? If you're investing in crypto, if you have Bitcoin, how do you, how do you store it? How are you staying secure? Right? Cause most clients aren't thinking about that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and and you're right. You have to be able to, to understand the technology in order to ask those questions. You have to be able to ask those questions as the advisor of the client, because you might have a client that's just interested. You might have a client that has a little bit of crypto and you get to ask, why did you buy this one? And if they go, I don't know, my, you know, my son told me or, or my brother told me or, or someone else, or I saw it advertised and I just bought it, then um, you can have very intelligent, knowledgeable, understanding conversations with them. And you can actually help guide and advise them on, okay, let's talk about what this means. Where does it fit your portfolio? You as the advisor are able to take it from speculation to investment at that point. If that's the direction the client wants to go, if they're like, no, no, I just want to throw a few hundred bucks at Shiba and see what happens, then all right, fine. We're not going to make this part of your portfolio. If it, if your couple hundred bucks turns into a hundred thousand, then we'll make it part of your investment portfolio and we'll, and we'll figure out what happens. But look, we have advisors go through this that, I mean, when we created the course, we didn't think about it as much that there are going, there are so many people now in the world 
that are ridiculously crypto wealthy, ridiculous, mm -hmm. you know, eight, nine, 10 figure wealthy. And most of them don't have financial advisors because they've never trusted anyone to help them with their money because most financial advisors don't know crypto. Well, now they're starting to ask, they're starting to go, all right, how do I make this part of my financial life? Just like if, if you started a business, Mark, and all of a sudden that business just absolutely blew up. You, you know, you start Instagram and all of a sudden, uh, you know, Facebook offers you a billion dollars for it. Yeah. Well, now you kind of need a financial advisor. It's not like you, you go, no, no, no. I made my billion without an advisor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this out myself. Mm -hmm. You're going to go, I, I need someone to help. I need a quarterback now. Same thing happens with, with a lot of the crypto people. Just because they made a lot of money in DeFi or crypto doesn't mean they really understand their financial life. They don't understand how to you know, buy a house and plan for college and retirement and expenses and income and all those things. You know, chances are they're like- or they, Yeah, there's not, there's not trust. And, and all that, yep. Exactly. They got, they, they're going to have tax issues and they're still going to need help. And they need an advisor that's not going to be like, no, no, sell everything you just made. And we're going to put 95% in an S&P fund and you, you can keep 5% in your crypto, your cute little crypto thing. Right. And by the way, we're, we're going to put it in a Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, that, right. That's not acceptable. The acceptable thing is I'm going to talk to you about this, just like I would talk to you about any other business, any other way that you made seven, eight, nine figures worth of, worth of wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we are seeing more and more and more of those types of clients come in. Yep. And that's where we get to, you know, again, talking about the CDAA course and, and how important the conversations are it, it, for advisors in the, the, the conversations they're going to have with clients, the understanding of that underlying technology so that one, they can ask clients those questions. They got a client walks in that, that's curious versus they have a client that walks in with you know, $10 million worth of crypto. They know what directions to go, what to ask, at least enough to know, look, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Then I'm going to come back to you in a few weeks with more questions because I don't understand all this, but at least they can go research without starting from square one. At least they can go, I, I need to learn about these few tokens that you bought. Uh, and, and why you might buy them and what kind of yield and all that. But I don't have to go back to what the hell is a blockchain. I can go back to, is this uh, an Ethereum token? Is this a Solana token? Is this some other chain? Like I can understand all those things. And it's also incumbent on the advisor to do the research on different custodial platforms, different funds that, that come out, different SMA managers, all of those things that, that in order to vet and do that research without just listening to whomever the vendor is, tell them how great they are. Yep. In order to actually do the research and figure out what's best for their client, they better understand the technology. Be because we as advisors have been served up so much of, the, uh, of what we do on a silver platter for so long that we just go, oh, well, I'm going to pick among Schwab, Fidelity, and whoever else, and Altruist as a, as a custodian, and they're going to have everything for me. I, I don't really have to know all that much. And I'm not saying it like, I, I don't want to say advisors don't know what they're doing. Like they're, they're ridiculously smart people and, and they, they really know what they're doing and they, and they do their homework. But the fact that those custodians are there means the advisor doesn't have to do as much homework on the underlying technology. Mm -hmm. They don't have to go, well, tell me where you're backed up. How are you redundant? You know, wh wh where are the, you know, who has the, the keys to the database? They don't have to ask those questions, but in crypto, you have to ask those questions. Yep. Okay. So we make sure, so the CDA, you start off, you go back to the beginning, you get all the, these foundational pieces um, set up. Um, what happens after you go through that? What else do you dive into in the CDA course? So we, okay, good question. So we dive into, um, into several realms of like compliance and regulation, right? Mm -hmm. of, co of course. But what we do first is we go down, okay, so Bitcoin takes several weeks, right? We got to go through Bitcoin. We got to go through investment thesis. That's without a doubt the the, the biggest, baddest dude on the block. We got to figure out how to fight that. And then we move into other tokens, specifically Ethereum, because that's, that's where most of DeFi is built. You, gotta have to under, you have to understand smart contracts. And there's no better place to understand smart contracts than Ethereum. And that's where we get into DeFi and everything that goes into DeFi, which are, you know, uh, we, we start with stable coins, then we go to lending protocols, because these are the basis of how an economy is built, right? You got to have a currency that, that you use that, that actually is relatively stable, is not bouncing up and down all the time. You got to be able to lend money because debt makes the entire world economy go, go round. You have to be able to trade things. So you got decentralized exchanges. We have to throw oracles in. You don't need that in traditional finance as much. We definitely need that here. Got to throw in what an oracle is. You got to add things like insurance. 
And then you go, all right, here's why it's not as efficient. So then you have other smart contract protocols and you have, you know, Tezos and Solana and, and Algorand and, and Avalanche and everything else, because we're getting those questions. And then we have to go into, of course, NFTs and DAOs and everything else, but it all comes from some sort of basis. And I will tell you without a, beyond a shadow of a doubt, every cohort we've done, and we're about to finish our sixth one, when we get to DeFi, the eyes light up everyone gets super <laughs> excited about it because as financial advisors, we know where the inefficiencies are in the system. And yeah. when you start seeing a, a, an, econ an economic system that goes, okay, we're going to take some of those inefficiencies out. We're going to hand them back to the people. We're going to find yield opportunities. That's crazy talk, mm -hmm. but we have it here. And that's when eyes light up and that's when aha moments happen. Yeah. And I think, uh, so inefficiencies, I like to talk to when we're talking with other advisors too, it's like, you know, these, these pain points, these suffering points, right. Um, you, we all understand it even more so from a financial perspective and financial operations and, and giving advice and develop in building portfolios and developing wall strategies and all that stuff. And then we, we develop all of that, but then when it comes to executing, there's still so many, uh, there, there's so many uh, efficiencies that can that can happen, and, and blockchain is, is can help us execute on that. All of these things we get upset about when we're trying to execute on all of these things that we build for our clients, and and I think that's where that frustration um, I think resonates a lot. And when you start learning about DeFi and its capabilities and kind of where where it's at and where it could go, it's it's hard not to get excited about it. So I, I totally <laughs> resonate with all the yeah. advisors in that course. And then do you guys get into this? So you mentioned stable coins, because again, I think stable coins are very, very important. One of the things that, that we've been doing a lot more um, deep dives into and, and where we have different theses on this is, you know, you know, obviously fiat backed stable coins versus algorithmic stable coins. Do you guys talk a little bit about that at all? Like, Oh, of course we, we have to talk about them. We have to talk about fiat for, you know, the, the back stable coins versus the, the, um, algorithmic ones versus eventually the the cbdc's mm -hmm. that that have come out and are coming out and um we have to differentiate between them because because advisors are just going to have to know like what's the difference between DAI and usdc exactly. why does you know why can DAI fluctuate and usdc can't and then and sometimes we get a little philosophical okay is usdc really better than just the dollar or is DAI, you know, better? Is DAI a more DeFi representation than USDC? And we can get all philosophical about it, but when it comes down to what the advisor is going to do for their clients, um, look, a client, uh, you know, clients probably want more USDC exposure, and I and I don't know that for sure, but it, clients are probably not really overly theoretical about it and going, no, 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 no. I, I want the one that's more decentralized. I want the one that's not actually backed by the dollar, which is backed by the government, which is deciding how much a dollar is worth. I want the one where as a decentralized community, we're deciding how much it's worth and that's die. It just so happens that the algorithm says that it should be worth a dollar. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, we definitely get into the different types of stable coins because we have to, because, and, and on top of that, there, you see the stable coins on Coinbase and Gemini, wherever you're, wherever you're trading or wherever you're buying crypto, you have to know the difference. And then you see something like Maker and you got to go, well, what's Maker? Well, Maker is the protocol that, and, and the DAO that runs DAI. Well, how does Maker, why does Maker different than DAI? And then we have to go into that. And everything <laughs> takes you down another rabbit hole yep. and it can get, be kind of exhausting. And I, I definitely have to you know, take a step back every time I'm doing one of these classes and go, have I blown everyone's heads off yet? Like, is everyone just exhausted from yeah. learning all this? Because I end up talking really fast, just like I'm doing now. I talk and I write and I keep going into it until someone stops me and is like, whoa, you got you to go back and explain something a little better, a little differently, or I'm not catching it. Because I've been talking about this for four years now. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's just kind of second nature. But, you know, for most, like it's brand new and it's mind blowing. It is. And that's where I think the a lot of the value that comes from a, a designation or the pro, not even just the designation, but the program itself, like, um, is the depth and breadth. I, cause again, if you go to an average, you know, an advisor who's, you know, done some homework on digital assets or crypto markets, whatever the case is, and you go ask them what a stable coin is, most of them are just going to either say it's a CBDC or it's USDC. They're going to, they're going to only think of fiat pegged stable coins, um, when it goes so much further. 
And so I wanted to, I'm glad you dove into that. So though, to highlight kind of the depth and breadth of what the CDA does. Um, right. just and, and, and keep in mind real, real quick, Mark, the, one of the reasons why we go into all the custodial solutions is not only to be, to evaluate, you know, who, who the best custodians are and, and, and like, how am I, how am I going to set up my practice? Am I going to go with a managed solution through one of the custodians? Am I going to try to you know, just advise my clients on how to buy crypto and put it in a hard wallet or something and, and, um, and, and you know, write out, here's the kind of the estate planning, because we all know that we know in crypto, estate planning is more about the technology than it is about the legal aspect, right? Like, it doesn't matter if I passed my Bitcoin to my kid, if my kid didn't have the private key, then I didn't pass anything. Yep. Um, so we, we go into those things, but we also want to talk about it from the perspective that if we fully believe, which we do, that we being those of us that created this course, um, that that the next generation or the next uh, iteration of the economic system or the financial system is going to be built on blockchain technology or partially on blockchain technology, then advisors better understand how custody works because they're going to have clients that have assets and income streams and everything coming from different custodial solutions, different wallets. They might have a security token that's held on a, you know, in, in a, Tezos wallet with some other custodian, and they might have a, um, you know, cryptocurrency, they might have an ETH wallet, they might have a Solana wallet, they, they're also going to have, you know, stocks, stocks might eventually be on some sort of blockchain. Advisors are going to have to understand this new definition of custodial technology, because and, and custodial options, because their clients are going to be multi custodial, they're not going to neatly fit all within Schwab or within Fidelity, because those uh, those companies, those custodians aren't going to have the, capa the capability to do it all, mm -hmm. nor do we want them to do it all. I don't want Schwab to have every private key for every account I have. Uh, so you're, you're starting to get into something I'd like to, you know, kind of go beyond just the technology piece and, you know, the financial aspects of the assets or um, tokens um, or coins um, is one thing that I think the CDA does is you're talking like it it teaches you how to implement into the business right now, you know, how can you do it, you know, from, you know, you mentioned before compliance, regulatory framework, you know, updating your, your ADV, your form CRS, all that stuff. So does the CDA go into all of that as well? Like um, take us through some of those things, just implementing it into the business structure of a, of an advisory firm. Yeah. So, so we talk a, um, a bit about what you should do, you know, where the compliance fits in, what is compliant, what's a, uh, a custodian, a qualified custodian look like, who are the qualified custodians in this space, uh, what you can do as an advisor. Of course, we are not compliance experts, so we're not going to tell the advisor, here's exactly what you do and here's the exact language to use. We are getting some attorneys to craft that language so you, we can just say, look, here's probably what you can use as the agreements with your clients. Um, but you need to run it by your compliance department first. You need to run it by your compliance experts first because it's got to fit in with what you do. It has to fit in with your ADV. Here's where you might have to change your ADV just a little bit uh, to, to reflect some of the new services. We also talk about the different ways that you as an advisor can offer services because, it, because you might want to offer crypto advice or DeFi advice on an hourly or project basis versus everything else might be an AUM basis because you, you might go, look, I, I don't want to take over any sort of custodial solution for my clients when it comes to crypto. I just want to, to advise them. I, I just want to say, here's how you uh, keep your, your crypto safe. And, here, and we're going to do a project that says, we're going to look at everything you have. We're going to figure out the basis. We're going to see where it fits in your portfolio. I'm going to help you with the estate planning piece. Um, and every time we meet every, you know, every six months, we'll look at what the value is and we'll see if it still makes sense for you. But I'm not going to, I, as the advisor, I'm not going to handle custody right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm just not prepared to do that yet. And if you and your ADV haven't set, haven't set forth, I'm going to have hourly fees or project fees, then you better go do that first. You can't, you can't start a project and charge for a project if it's not part of your ADV, mm -hmm. if you haven't told the state of the SEC yet. So we do warn about those things that are, you know, typical compliance things, but you don't think about it much until you're, you're venturing into a, this whole new world. Yeah, no, absolutely. No. And again, uh, some of the value add from the program uh, aren't just the, the technology pieces. So it's, I'm, I'm happy you were able to go through that. So 
Well, I did have one more question about the CDAA and kind of to, to end that off with, and I'd love to start talking about a little bit about, you know, DAOs and specifically Planner DAO, which um, you are part of and one of the founding members of. Um, but for advisors listening, can you just kind of maybe go through some, think back to some of the feedback you've gotten from advisors who have gone through the course? What are some of the, so what's some of the feedback where advisors have told you this is the most value I got from it? What, what's that feedback look like so far? Um, so far, some of the feedback is pe- people really uh, appreciate one, a lot of the, the Bitcoin talk. Like I said, B- Bitcoin is the, without a doubt, the elephant in the room. We all have to talk about Bitcoin. And there is a lot of appreciation in understanding the volatility, understanding why these big moves happen and, and, and being able to look past whatever they, they see on TV or read on Twitter or wherever and understand who they're listening to this news from. And, and I used air quotes way down here, but mm-hmm. there, was, there were air quotes around that news, I promise. Um, <laughs> understand where they're getting their news or their research or wherever from and be able to understand what's happening, especially with Bitcoin, because that's the, the one that everyone knows and it, and it moves around um, and understand uh, the, the other thing that they appreciate is why are there so many cryptocurrencies? Because a lot of people come in and go, well, there can only be one winner. They're all exactly the same. And we explain, no, no, no there's each one has kind of its own use case and its own reason for being. Uh, we don't always agree with those reasons for being that they should have value, but that doesn't mean that they don't have that. Yeah. And in you as the advisor understand, okay, here's why there are multiple cryptocurrencies. I think the next thing that's appreciated is they can at least have conversations around it to the point that um, I get email, I get at least three emails, emails a week from people looking for financial advisors that can help them with crypto. Mm-hmm. And I hand those off to CDAA members. I, I don't, we, I don't actually practice anymore. So I have to hand those off. So that's always nice that we have advisors that have been through the program. They get clients uh, or get prospects because of it. Right now, one of our advisors, um, because of just because of talking about the fact that he's been going through this, talking about the fact that he's go- going through this course, and you know, just kind of talking with clients and other people about crypto and, and understanding what he does, is now talking to a nine-figure crypto prospect. And, and by the way, nine-figure crypto prospects have friends who are nine-figure crypto prospects. <laughs> yep, I was going to say they that they're kind of run in the same circles. Yep. And so that's really what we're seeing a lot of now is, is advisors who are going, man, I'm, I'm getting clients because of this. I'm getting new clients because of this. Yes, I'm keeping some of my clients who are interested in it from leaving me, but a lot of, you know, a lot of clients aren't going to leave their advisor right now because they won't learn crypto. They're, they're just going to go, all right, I'm going to do my crypto investing on my own, just like I might have a Robinhood account or I might have an E-Trade account and do some of that in, on my own. More than likely, though, those those people who have crypto in their portfolio uh, are looking for an advisor who knows about it. And if you're that advisor, then you're going to going to get those clients. Love it. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. I hope yeah. if, if you're listening to this or watching this, uh, you know, you've heard some of the feedback that, that Adam has gotten from advisors who've gone through it. We are Arbor Digital. Uh, we are currently going through it ourselves. Um, there is another designation program and, you know, we could spend the whole time talking about that, but I don't think we need to dive into that. Um, but we're excited. We, we really love the content, Adam. So I know from us, we really appreciate you going in and there's been some huge differentiators from what we've seen in, in the different programs that we've taken. So okay. um, really appreciate you taking on the responsibility and taking that leap because it's a big one. <laughs> It, it, it is. And, and I appreciate that. And look, there, there are going to be others and I'm totally okay with it. We built it the way I would want to learn it, basically. Yeah. I said, how, how would I like to learn it? And this is how I would like to learn it. And sometimes we probably go too in depth and that's okay. I, I'm not, I'm definitely not versed in course creation or education. So, um, and, and we can talk in just a few minutes and I think we'll get down that road about how excited I am about the prospects of new course creation. Well, yeah. So that's where uh, I would love to take it there now. Uh, I think though the th- a differentiator of the of the program as well is the connection to uh, Planner DAO, right? Right. Um, and DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, for those listening and, and haven't heard of what a DAO is, um, are a hot topic right now. You know, given the whole Constitution DAO and kind of what happened with, you know, the 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 coalition that was brought together through this DAO to raise funds to to buy a piece of this 
uh, history. Um, so it's like, it's, it's a buzzword now. Um, but you've kind of started this planner down this connection with the CDA. Can you take us through what is that connection? What's a DAO? Like, how are you structuring? Like, take us through the beginning. Okay. So in, um, gosh, it was like April or May of this year after we had gone through, I think one whole cohort, probably one and a half cohorts of the CDAA is when Steve Larson called and said, Hey, I have an idea. Uh, tell me if I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. And his idea was, I want to start a DAO for financial advisors. I want to call it Planner DAO. And um, I was sitting here with Ron and we had it on speaker and, and I kind of listened for a while. And then I said, one, I'm fairly certain, Steve, that you've already bought like PlannerDAO.com and probably PlannerDAO.eth and all that. He said, yeah, I have. And then I said, your idea is so good. I'm jealous that it was your idea and not mine. Um, because we just, we knew we like, it was way ahead, but we, we knew that's kind of what had to be created was yeah. some sort of organization for financial advisors. And we had all different directions it could go and, and all different reasons why you want to have a decentralized, a, a basically just a collaborative group of financial advisors. Yep. And we're all members of different groups. We're all members of, you know, FPA or NAFA or NAPFA or MDRT or whatever other groups we're a member of. But those are all groups where we pay a, a fee and we expect to get something in return, whether that's lunch and continuing education. And that group might lobby a little bit and, and you know, have an annual conference and all that where we all get together and get more education and more dinners and you know, a few drinks and all that. We said, why shouldn't those groups have some sort of value to them? Why shouldn't the people within those groups have some reason to come together and actually drive the industry forward? That's really what we need. And DAOs and the and and most importantly, a cryptocurrency, a currency for that DAO or a token for that DAO is what drives that forward, is what gives you and I the incentive to come together in this group and come up with ideas, see those ideas become a product or a service or something, because that's what's going to drive the value of the group. And we have an incentive to do that because we have a token. Now. When all that was said and done, we said the next step is we have to give the designation over to the DAO. Because when Ron and Steve and I started the designation, we said, this is going to have to have some sort of board. It can't be Adam and Ron and Steve's designation. And yeah. we decide what is in the best interest of, for digital assets. It has to be a, a group of people that has an interest in, in what happens. And we thought we were going to have to have a board, a nonprofit group and a board. But a DAO fits that even better because any financial advisor can come join Planner DAO and be part of the education working group and therefore drive, help drive the direction of this certification. Yeah. Uh, so many things to dive into there. Uh, so Planner Sorry, I, I tend to talk fast and get excited about it. I apologize. No, don't apologize. It's, it's all good. Um, the energy is palpable and that's what we need. We want other people to get energized by it, but um, connecting the designation and making, making that to underneath the, the DAO is really interesting to me. And again, really early and uh, truly understanding how it's gonna fit. Um, but when you start to think about kind of what you mentioned with other organizations and groups and how we get designated currently in the, in the current system and, and all of that stuff, it's like, well, the next generation of learners or designees, if you will, um, they're going to want to communicate and want to, you know, I guess, put out into the world what they've learned and, and continue to keep learning in that, like in a different way and developing this community this way through in a decentralized way makes a lot of sense. And it's just such a different way. And I think it has the capability of being much more, I guess, impactful, like on a, on a global basis, right? Like when you're decentralized, it, it opens up just all new possibilities, right? And you've already hit on a couple of those possibilities. Um, and then when you have people who are, when you align a cent incentive, so actually maybe it would be behoove us too, to talk a little bit more just about DAOs in general. So like, why even do a DAO? Like what, like, it's a great idea. What made it a great idea? Let's, let's start there. When, when Steve said the idea, what did make it a good idea? Uh, well, it was kind of what I just said, right? It, we're a part of, of many different organizations of financial advisors. So we thought why the, the idea of one, practicing what we preach, right? We talk about DAOs and we talk about decentralization. Why wouldn't we do that? 
mm -hmm. in some sort of group? Why wouldn't we be the, the first to start a, an organization of financial advisors? Uh, so that I think makes it a good idea in just saying, look, you're, it, not only do we talk about DAOs in our course, but we actually have one. So I can talk to you about how they work from the inside as, as well as from the outside. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece. Another piece is um, it makes sense from the perspective of why find a board to manage the CDAA when, you know, and put together a nonprofit organization when we, when a DAO can be a nonprofit organization, but it can also be an organization of just financial advisors mm -hmm. and, and that can continue to grow and derive value. Look, financial advisors, and, and you probably know this pretty well, on the, the kind of the financial stack of, of how it goes, you have the regulators way up here, and then beneath that is you know, custodians, and beneath that is fund companies, and beneath that is asset managers, and then down here is the clients, and in between here are the financial advisors that get squeezed on all the fees. All these people are charging certain things and, and telling them, telling the advisors what they can and can't do and can and can't sell and how they can do it and how much they can charge, and under here you have the clients going, well, we don't want to pay too much, but we want to have unbelievable performance and unbelievable advice, but we're only willing to pay this much. And you as the advisor, which is the biggest group of people is getting totally squeezed. Well, why shouldn't the group that's closest to the actual client be the ones that have some sort of power and value there? And if you can consolidate and collaborate all those people, that's exactly what a DAO should do. If, you, if you've heard people theoretically talk about DAOs, if you've heard uh, um, Amin talk about DAOs, uh, and if anyone you know is on Twitter and knows Amin, like he, he's kind of the the godfather of DAOs as we know them, um, talks about the, the value in the collaboration. So if you collaborate a bunch of financial advisors that are right there next to the client, and we know exactly what we need, then we go, all right, well, the value of having all those people together for, for some common purposes, you can create some pretty cool products, some pretty cool services, a lot of value. There's a lot of reason that all these people up above want to get to this little sliver right here and try to go, well, we have a product, we have a service, and, and this little sliver can go, you know what, Here, here's what we want to do. You got to do what, what we ask, or you got to pay, or both, right? Why shouldn't we have the power to do that? And the only way to do that is to collaborate, consolidate, and then we feel like have, have, have a token or some sort of way to value that group, some sort of way that group can show and realize its value that they've never had before. So a reason to come together and actually make the industry better. And that reason is, is quite honestly, a financial one that says, I want the value of my token to go up. Yep. So for me, when you started talking about um, these benefits, um, it, it aligns with kind of the way I think about it too. Uh, you know, I used to serve as a consultant to advisors, right? Um, underneath one umbrella, right? And I did it at two different firms, both big. And, you know, one thing, especially for the advisor community, which I found was a common theme was like every, every, every top performer, every, every advisor who wanted to be at the top of their game in terms of being the best advisor for their clients, were continuously seeing what every other top performer was doing as well. And there was no really elegant way to get them together or communicate in a timely way or in a, in an efficient way, just logistically. Right. Um, mm -hmm. What if you could do that across the entire industry? And that's what I think of is that, that a DAO can do. What if financial planners from all of these, and this is where you mentioned, like traditionally you get them all together at these conferences once a year, twice a year, but there really isn't collaboration. It's more just like, I'll poach you from this room. You come work for us. <laughs> and you know, I, I, we can right. offer you this incentive package because uh, we like your ideas and we love what you're doing over there, but we would love to incorporate that here. What if that wasn't needed? And then again, your incentive package isn't from, you know, trying to take someone from there. We're all incentivized through this token underneath the DAO, right? Exactly. Like, it's mind blowing to think about actually. And actually it's a huge value, right? Because again, what learning as a consultant, understanding, you know, how do you keep, because again, being an advisor is not just how do I be a good advisor today and in the next five years, it's like you're setting up businesses and you're setting up relationships that you're going to have for the next 20 years. And even if you're not that advisor, that client that you've now set up will either be an advisor with whoever you're going to, you know, um, leave your legacy to. Um, right. And so when you, if you can create this network of advisors that it doesn't matter if you work at 
the wirehouses or discount brokerages or wherever, you can have advisors from every pocket communicating with each other, sharing best practices through in a decentralized way, all pushing the industry forward. I so you mentioned how you you thought Steve's idea, you were jealous because you wish you it's so good you wish you had it first. Yeah, I feel the same way because man, just when you think about the power of that. It's just what I think about. Exactly. And the, and the, um, it's probably one of those things that, you know, I might have thought of at some point, like, oh, we should have a, a DAO for advisors. And I probably said it to Ron and all, and both of us kind of giggled, like, no, there's no way advisors <laughs> would do that. We're not going to do that. It's going to be three or four years before they, they do that. And Steve was the one who said, no, 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 we should do it. We should do it right now. Like, don't wait, do it right now. And yeah, it's going to be really hard to explain and it's going to be really hard to figure out how we're, we're actually going to run it and manage it and what we're going to do and where there's going to be value. But the coolest part about it is once we came together, yeah, we, we've had some you know, ups and downs and such. But now uh, when I tell you, we are absolutely hitting our stride and we have got some cool stuff coming. And I use the word cool as if I'm actually cool, which I'm really not, <laughs> um, that some, some really interesting things and some plays going on where we go, man, we can really have we, we can have some value. We can impact the industry. We can impact DeFi because if we're the gatekeeper, not, not the gatekeeper, if we're the entree for all these financial advisors, literally all over the world, we have members of Planner Dow that are from all over the world. And we've had so many of them reach out and go, we want a CDAA in our country. We want it with our regulations and our compliance and in our language. How do we do that? I just, as we were talking, I got a message from one of our members who's in Brazil at a CFP conference. And he said, they want to figure out how to get CDAA in Brazil. That's really exciting because if we can be the entree for all these advisors to get their clients even a little bit into DeFi, that's a huge amount of adoption. And I don't want to do it because I want my DeFi token value to go up. Mm -hmm. I want it because that this is the next iteration. This is where it should go. And having someone trusted like an advisor to help people through it is, is probably a little bit easier. It's probably a little bit better. And if those advisors get ahead of the game, not only are they going to get more clients, which is, which is really great for them, but they're, they're already going to be thinking about that next gen. They're already going, going to be thinking about what yield looks like and how we bring the world economy together and how we make it more efficient. And it's going to be that much easier when you start having advisors that understand it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's, that, that to me is you know, so exciting to see advisors all over the world joining us. And look, there are people joining that go, look, I don't want to be I, I want to be a financial, you know, do I have to be a financial advisor to go through the course? And I go, well, I don't, I don't care. Like you have to have money to pay to go through the course. If you want to go through the course, that's yeah. pretty much it. But that leads us to, okay, what, what are you going to advise? Like, are you going to advise on what to buy? Or are you just going to educate? If you're just going to educate people, I don't think you have to be licensed for that. I don't think you have to be registered for that, but you can go through my course and maybe there's an opportunity for people who are, you know, para DeFi advisors or something yeah. that aren't, SEC registered or, or, or registered in whatever country they are, but they're just kind of worldwide. I'm going to teach you how to use a wallet and move into DeFi and all that. I'm just not going to explain. I'm not going to give you advice on what you should do from a buying tokens perspective. I'm just going to help you with custody. I'm going to help you with understanding protocols, but not tell you what to do. Maybe there's room for that. Maybe there's room to go even higher up the chain and go, okay, once you do that, there, what's a certified digital like asset manager? So you're, you're doing kind of what you guys do at, at Arbor and go, how do we manage DeFi funds now? How do we manage Dow treasuries? Yep. We can go so much farther because we're going to have this collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned uh, some of the exciting stuff. So yes, I'm right there with you. Very excited about the future of what Planner Dow can be and the CDA and that partnership. Is there anything else you would highlight kind of what's, can you give people a peek uh, in terms of the future? What else is coming up? Yeah, so we, uh, I can't tell who it is yet, but we have a, um, a top 10 university that is going to uh, teach a CDAA course. They're going to help develop it. And that's why I'm excited about getting to work with their instructional development team that I'll learn actually how to create a course, mm -hmm. not just by feel and whatever I want to talk about that day, but here's how you structure a course and they're going to help me do it, but they're going to teach it at their university. Uh, which is a, a top 10 university in the country, which I'm pretty excited about. We have some potential education partners because what we want to do is have other partners be able to teach a course that goes towards the CDAA designation. We want Planner Dow to manage the designation and others be able to actually provide the education content, much like the CFP board. The CFP board manages the CFP exam and what you have to know. 
and everyone else gets to teach the class, teach those courses and teach the CEs. And it goes back to the CFP board. That's what we want to build. And so we're talking to education, education partners, like I said, here and all over the world. That's really exciting. Uh, we have some other things in, in the world of DeFi that we're working on, some other ways that we're going to help advisors get their clients directly into DeFi uh, that, that we're actually working with attorneys on to figure out what the compliance is, to figure out what the regulations say before we go any, any further. Because it's all cool, but if it's illegal, then we can't do it, right? If it's not compliant, we can't do it. So that's kind of the key is, is keeping the compliance there. So those are, are some of the really fun, uh, interesting things we work on that um, I can't talk as much about because we're just not done. We're not, we're not to that point yet. But hey, if you were a member of Planner Down and you jumped in there and you jumped in the working groups, we, we can't, you know, once you're in there, like we can't keep it a secret. You're, you're part of jumping in and helping us. Yep. Right. And that's the cool part is you can come join Planner Down if you're a financial advisor and you can jump in one of the working groups and actually start helping. Oh, I love it. Well, that's actually the, that leads me into the call to action to everyone here listening on this. Um, if we've piqued your interest, uh, about the CDA program or Planner DAO and what we're trying to, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, I know Arbor Digital is very much aligned with what uh, y'all are doing over there, and we're we're committing uh, some of our resources to to helping get that off the ground. Um, but go sign up. It's PlannerDAO.io, P L A double N E R I O or uh, D A O dot I O. And then what's the, and then the CDA, is that a separate website or is that connected? Yeah, it's uh, uh, certifieddigital.org. Okay, perfect. Certifieddigital.org is the CDAA website. The next cohort will start, will be sometime in January. We're, we're again, reworking it to where uh, we're going to have different education partners. And my company, Interaxis, is actually going to be one of the education partners uh, I, in all honesty, I didn't really want to keep doing that uh, <laughs> if I'm if I'm really being honest. But we there's so much demand for people wanting to learn about this that I said we, we'll just keep going until such time as there are so many other education partners that it doesn't make sense for us to keep doing it. But for now, we just want to get more people educated about it, get more CDAA members, get more Planner Down members, um, because the the more we grow, the more people come in here, they they get excited about what we're doing. And they have ideas and they go, can I, can I go run with this idea? Can I go run with that idea? And we want to give them the framework to go, yeah, go figure it out, go form a group. You know, you can ask for a budget, whatever you want. And, and we'll probably figure out how to make it happen. Yeah. Again, so many, uh, so much experimentation, but it's fun. It's going to be exciting to see what, what all comes out from this. Um, but Adam, before we, before we adjourn for the day, uh, where can people find you? Not just your businesses, but but you. Do you have? Do you are you active on Twitter, LinkedIn? Uh, where where can they find you? Uh, pretty active on Twitter. Interaxis eight. So at Interaxis eight, the number eight is my Twitter handle. Uh, you, our YouTube channel is Interaxis. Our website is interaxis.io. Um, the, those are probably the the best spots to find us. Awesome. Well, Adam, I really appreciate you joining us for today. I'm so happy we got to dive into the CDAA. We got to dive into DAOs and specifically planner DAO. Um, if, you, if you find anything that uh, from value from this, if you're listening, uh, please reach out to, to Adam, reach out to us at Arbor Digital. Happy to, to dive into any of this more. But until next time, we appreciate you and be sure to tell someone you care about them. Bye, everybody. We appreciate you listening to this edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. I'm your host, Mark Nichols. Please don't forget to let us know how you like the show by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. For more downloadable digital asset resources and educational opportunities, please visit us at arbordigital.io. We are here to help you get off zero safely and securely. Thanks again for tuning in and be sure to tell someone you care about them. Cheers. We are financial advisors. However, we are not your financial advisor. Unless you're under contract with or actively speaking with Arbor Capital Management or Arbor Digital, a division of Arbor Capital Management. This podcast is just that, a podcast. It is not financial, legal, or tax advice. 
If you have individual questions, please reach out.